All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? All right, so um, today we're going to continue our discussion of caches. Um, last time we talked about uh, why we want to introduce caches, which is basically to make it seem to the processor like we have a large and fast memory rather than a large and slow memory. And today we're going to actually look into how we go about implementing this memory system that consists of both an SRAM cache and a DRAM main memory. But just before we get started, we have some greetings from Japan. Arvin sent us this picture yesterday and uh, hopefully you can read the little note that's specifically to you guys. Um, and in fact, I'm not sure if you can see it, but right here is that note <laughs> hanging up in this shrine. Anyways, so, all right, let's get started with a little bit of review, um, just so that we, before we get into the implementation, we're all on the same page. So, we learned last time about um, uh, the fact that we can have different kinds of caches. The most basic one is your direct mapped cache. And this is what your direct mapped cache looks like. You basically have an address, which is a 32-bit address, and we divide that address up into three portions, the tag, the index, and the offset. And specifically, if I have a cache that has two to the k lines, then I'm going to need k index bits in order to select which of the cache lines I'm trying to access. Okay. Um, then I'm going to have, uh, I'm, once I select the line, I'm going to look at all of the data that's in that line. And now remember that um, if our block size is larger than one, then I don't just have, you know, one word stored in this cache line. I might have multiple words, which is what's shown here. So now the next thing that I need to do is look at the tag of the line that I just fetched and determine if it's equal to the tag that I want. And so I'm going to compare the tag bits. And, um, and I'm going to check whether the valid bit is true or not. And finally, if I got a hit, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the offset bits in order to determine which of the words in that cache line is the one that I'm actually trying to access. And you'll notice here that um, the, the bits that we're using in order to select the word are just B minus 1 down to 2. So what happens with the bottom two bits? What are they used for? They're, zero. They're both zero because our addresses are byte addresses and we're always accessing things at a word boundary, okay? So if you wanted to figure out the number of uh, words in this cache line, you'd basically know that it's two to the b bytes or two to the b minus two words is how many words we have in this cache line. Any questions about that? Yes? Um, is the minus two inside of the exponent or like Yes. Yes. Is there a tag for each separate word that's stored in? No, it's one tag. So that's one of the benefits of having a block size larger than one is that the proportion of your cache that's used up for your tag bits is much smaller. But wouldn't it be that if you have a single tag that would only correspond to a single word of data? Why would you? No, because you're assuming that the things that are in the same line are contiguous locations in memory. So you can figure out, based on the offset bits, what exactly the address is. Okay, yes? Why do we zero out the two bottommost bits? I thought we were going to use them for the offset somehow. We, uh, no, so it's a little confusing the way it's, it was drawn in the previous lecture, which is that the bottom two bits are lumped into what we call the offset. And so the bottom two bits are really just for word alignment always. And so they change our address from a byte address to a word address. And then the rest of the offset bits are the ones that we use in order to select a word from within the line. Okay? Anything else? Great. So let's move on to um, the other type of caches that we learned about, which are n-way set associative caches. 
And so the idea here is that um, the difficulty with direct map caches is that for any particular address, there's exactly one cache line that it can map to. And so if you happen to want uh, two addresses that happen to map to the same cache line, they're not going to be able to live in the cache at the same time. So by switching from a direct map cache to an uh, NYA set associative cache, we can have multiple things that map to the same index in our cache at the same time. So so typically, the associativity that's generally used is between 4 and 8, but um, just for our purposes, we're going to work on a simpler model, which is we're going to assume that we have a two-way set associative cache, as shown here. So now what happens? Um, what's different from our direct mapped cache? Well, basically, um, the index bits, the k bits, are still used in order to select the line. And now it's actually selecting what we call a set. So there's one line in each of the two ways that's being selected by that index. Okay. Then what I need to do is I need to compare my tag to the tag in both of those lines. And so I'm going to have here um, not only the comparison in my first way, but I also need to compare the tag in my second way, and it's possible for me to get a hit in either one of those. Now, is it going to be possible for me to get a hit in both? I see some shaking of heads. Who can tell me why we might not want that? Yep. Because then you know, like one of them might be older or not updated. Sure, that's a good reason, but also it would just be a waste of space. So generally when we're desi designing our cache, we're going to make sure that a particular address only lives in one way of our cache. Okay, um, so when we check to see if it's there, we check all of the ways, um, but we're guaranteed that uh, if we found a hit, then that's the only place we're going to find the hit. All right, so the next thing is, you know, I pull down the data from uh, both of these ways corresponding to the index that was selected. And now, depending on whether or not I got, you know, a hit in way one or a hit in way two, or I just got a miss altogether, um, I'm going to determine whether I'm going to use the data that's coming from uh, one of these two caches or whether I'm going to have to go and look it up in main memory. So assuming that one of them gave me a hit, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, um, suppose way one gave me a hit, then I'm going to get the data that's in this way coming through this multiplexer. And now I'm going to use my offset bits in order to select the particular word that I was looking for within that line of that way. Yes? How do we check if there's a hit? If there's a hit? Yes. Uh, that's checked by this other logic right here. And so that's going to control whether you're using this data at all or whether you're going uh, have additional logic that's going off to the main memory and making a request. Okay? All right, terrific. So that at a high level summarizes um, what we learned last time. All right, so um, in recitation yesterday, we added a little bit more to that, which were there, there's a few other questions that we need to ask ourselves when designing our caches. So specifically, when we're doing a store, we need to ask ourselves, what is our write back policy? So we have two choices, hopefully you're familiar with this. Um, we have a write back policy and a write through policy. So a write back policy means that you're only going to write to main memory when you're evicting the line from the cache. Okay, And so that saves you a lot of bandwidth because you don't have to write every single time to the main memory because you might just be overwriting it again. So what was the point of spending that effort? The second one is a write through policy, which basically keeps the cache and the memory in sync. And so every time you're writing to your cache, you're also writing to your main memory. All right. Now, another thing we probably haven't seen yet, which also, um, oh, sorry, let me just, <laughs> one more thing. So in order to support write back caches, um, it's not enough to just have a valid bit that's telling us, you know, is our data valid or invalid? We actually have to have a little bit more information. And so now we want to know if our state is one of three things. It's either invalid or it's clean, meaning that I have valid data, but I haven't modified it, or it's dirty, meaning Meaning that um, it's valid, and uh, but I did modify it, and so the value that I have in the cache is not consistent with what I have in main memory. 
Okay, so the other thing that we want to think about is what do we do on a right miss? So here, once again, we have two choices. I can either choose to bring the line that I'm trying to access into my cache when I have that miss um, and then do the write, or I can say, well, I don't want to bother bringing it into my cache and I'm just going to write directly to uh, main memory. So the first one where we bring it into our cache is what we refer to as a misallocate scheme. The second one is a miss no allocate. And you'll see that I've uh, color coded these. So basically, usually what happens is that we use a write back policy together with a uh, uh, write miss allocate, or you use a write through policy together with a no allocate. But um, we're going to stick to the red one, so we're going to basically be using a write back policy and uh, write miss allocate. Okay? All right, so now let's remind ourselves, you know, what happens when we're processing a load or a store. So the first thing that happens is we're going to send the address that we're, um, the processor is going to send the address of the memory location that it's trying to access. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check our cache to see if that address is, um, if the data for that location is in our cache. And so one of two things can happen. We either get, find it in the cache, which we call a hit, or we don't find it in the cache, which we call a miss. So if we have a hit, then if it was a load operation, then what we're going to do is we're going to return a copy of the data that the processor was, um, was uh, requesting um, from the cache line directly and it's going to be returned quickly. If it's a store, then we're going to update the word in the cache. Um, and if we're using a write back policy, we're also going to change the state to dirty to indicate that we wrote to that line. Now, if it's um, a miss, then what we have to do is we're going to bring our line from the missing line from main memory into our cache. And so we're going to first have to you know, select a line that's currently in the cache that we're going to evict from our cache. Um, and so there's going to be a question of, well, how do I select which one to take out of my cache? And we'll get to that in the next slide in just a second. But so once I've decided which one I'm going to take out of my cache, then I basically write, if it, that line was dirty, I would write it back to my main memory. And then I can go ahead and fetch the value that I'm trying to actually access from main memory and put it into that location in the cache of the, the what, wherever the thing that I just evicted from the cache was. Yes? Uh, I'm wondering if there's ever a situation in which we request something from main memory, but it's not in main memory either. So we're going to get to that in a few lectures. And yes, that's when we're going to start to learn about virtual memory. And so for now, you know, we're just telling you to think of a model where main memory has everything. Um, but we will get to that as well. Any other questions? Okay, great. All right, so um, as I mentioned, we need to decide, you know, which is the line that we're going to replace. And so we have to think about what our replacement policy is. And um, there could be many different replacement policies. In the case of a direct mapped cache, is there a replacement policy at all? Do I have any choice? No, why not? Yep. Because there is specific lines we'll have to write to, so you have to pick that one. Exactly. So in a direct map cache, given the address that I'm trying to access, that's the line that the, 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 the value, the line that's currently at that index is what I'm going to have to evict. But in the case of um, set associative cache, then I do have some choices, right? I have n different ways. So I can choose one of those n ways as the one that I want to get rid of from my cache in order to bring, you know, one new value at that index into my cache. So how do I pick which one? Well, typically a very common algorithm is to use what's called least recently used. And the reason we want to use something like least recently used is because of the locality principle, which is saying if I've used something recently, then I'm likely to use it again. So I don't want to get rid of something in my cache that I just used very recently because I'm likely to want it again and then I'll get a miss the next time I access it. So the, my best bet is to get rid of the thing that I haven't used in the longest amount of time. Okay, and um, there are other policies, but least recently used is 
um, kind of the, the most common and it's the one that we're going to be implementing um, in lab six. And specifically, if you just have a two-way set associative cache, then you can actually implement least recently used by just adding white, one bit of state to each of your, um, of your cache lines. And you'll see that as part as of your implementation of a two-way set associative cache in lab six. Okay, so one uh, last question about our cache before we actually get into the details of implementing it is that we can have two forms of a cache. We call it either a blocking cache or a non-blocking cache. A blocking cache is one where we can only handle one request at a time. So if you know I get a miss and I need to go over to my main memory in order to, to get the value that I missed, the cache can't at that time continue to receive a new um, request from the processor. On the other hand, in a non-blocking cache, it can. And so you can handle multiple requests at the same time. So while the main memory is processing uh, the miss request, the cache can continue to respond uh, to other requests. As you can imagine, the non-blocking one is uh, much more complex. So we're going to focus on the blocking caches. And that's what we're going to be implementing in this class. OK. So at this point, we've covered basically all of the different ideas that we need to consider in the design of our caches. Now we're going to start to actually implement them. <clears throat> So we're going to start with our memory interfaces. So you've seen already this memory interface, which basically um, shows that when I try to access a memory, I have two possible methods, either request or response. And in the case of a, a request, I basically send a memory request type to it, which consists of three different pieces of information. It's got the operation that I'm trying to do, which is a load or a store. It's got the address of the location I'm trying to access. And in the case of a store, it also has the data that I'm trying to write to that location. Okay, And for the response, I'm basically going to always return a word, meaning that um, as far as you know, we're dealing with our memories, we're basically assuming that our interfaces are as simple as possible. And as a result, the size of our memory and our addresses are fixed. OK, so we're going to always treat our memory as having, you know, 32 bit addresses and words being 32 bits um, at a high level. OK, now we're going to take this interface and we're going to model the same thing for our DRAM, our dynamic random access memory. And so here, once again, we have a request and response. We have the two methods that we need in order to communicate with our uh, main memory, except that now, instead of trying to access one word at a time, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be accessing um, an entire block, or we call it an entire line, right? So if my cache supports um, a block size of 16, meaning that it holds uh, 16 words per line, and then any time I go to the main memory, I'm going to fetch 16 words at a time, okay? Because I'm going to replace the entire line in my cache every time I go to main memory, okay? Is that clear to everyone? Okay, great. So, <clears throat> so that's what I mean by this uh, line request over here. And so you'll see that it's very similar to a memory request in that it provides the operation we're performing, it provides a line address, and in the case of a store, it provides the line that you're actually going to write back uh, to main memory. Okay? All right. So now, once again, also the DRAM is going to be a fixed size. And the size that we're going to assume for this class is 64 bytes. And so that's why I use the example of 16 words. So essentially, every time we go to main memory, we're going to be fetching 16 words at a time. OK, and so finally comes our SRAM, which is <coughs> what we use for our cache. In the case of our SRAM, we do actually want to specify what the size of it. Specifically, we want to specify how many rows are in our cache. And the way that we do that is by providing the number of index bits in this field right here, index size. Right. So if I um, instantiate an SRAM with six index bits, that means that I have two to the six lines in my cache. And then in addition, the SRAM can hold any data type. And so when we instantiate SRAMs, we also specify what kind of data 
um, it's holding, right? And so this will allow me to do things like, um, you know, have uh, one or two bit uh, data for my uh, state, which is keeping track of is something valid, clean, or dirty. It'll have, you know, an n bit um, uh, SRAM for the tag, and then and it'll have a 64 uh, byte um, SRAM for, for the line. Okay, and we'll see that in detail in just a moment. So the key is just that, you know, as, so as far as our SRAM is concerned, we are specifying that the size of the SRAM is two to the index size lines. Okay, so now let's start with our actual implementation. So um, in cached memory systems, we said that what's happening is we have our processor, which is kind of represented here on the left, which has its register file and the PC, the program counter, and it's communicating just with the cache. And so this is an SRAM-based cache. And then the cache is going to communicate with the, with the DRAM or the main memory on the back end um, if it, it, it's being asked for some information that it doesn't have. Yeah? Oh, on the last slide, what is uh, the line type? So it, it refers to when you're getting, fetching 16 words at a time. So in a general case, it's basically, you know, the number of words that you're fetching from main memory at the same time. And if you recall, when we studied, uh, when we talked about um, just main uh, memory implementations, we also mentioned that it's, you know, pretty costly to get that first byte from main memory, but it turns out that it's only incrementally more expensive to get, you know, bytes that are nearby. And so it turns out that it's really not only because of locality, but also because it doesn't cost us that much more to get the additional bytes. We generally, when we get something from main memory, we get a chunk of data at a time rather than just, you know, one byte or one word. Okay? Okay. So, um, so the difference here between you know the the request that the processor is making and the request that the um, SRAM is making is that these are word requests. So it's requesting, it's providing a 32-bit address and it's expecting a 32-bit response. Whereas when the SRAM requests something from DRAM, it's making these line requests. Okay, so it's going to be requesting, as I mentioned, 16 words at a time. Okay, so if I need to, you know, instantiate these two systems, all I would do is I would declare a DRAM and an SRAM. Um, I would, I have primitives which are given for you, which is make DRAM and make SRAM. And in the case of SRAM, I need to also specify how large it is. And so I provide the number of index bits in order to specify how many lines are in my cache. And then I also provide what kind of data it's holding. Yes. Is a line request also a 32-bit address? Uh, no. Um, so it's, it, I'll get to that, okay? Okay. Um, okay, and so this is just reiterating what I've been saying, which is we're gonna assume 16-word uh, lines, okay? Okay, so here's the type of cache that we're gonna be implementing. We're actually gonna be implementing two different versions in lab six, but we're gonna start with a direct mapped one. And so we have a one way or a direct mapped cache. It's a write back, write misallocate, and blocking cache. And so just to remind ourselves quickly what each of those things means, the write back policy means that we're gonna use the dirty bit, and so we're only gonna write things back to main memory when we evict the line from the cache. The write miss allocate means that on a miss, we're going to always bring the line back into our, uh, into our cache, so we're never going to just write straight into our main memory. And the blocking cache means that we can only process um, one request at a time. All right. So let's first think about my cache interface. So for my SRAM, we said that my interface was just, I had two methods, request and response. But if we look at our SRAM here, how many you know, uh, methods does it need to have? It needs to have four methods because it needs to support the request and response from the processor. And it also needs to be able to create a line request and deal with a line response from the DRAM, okay? And so 
what we're going to have is basically a, another interface, which is our cache interface. And in our cache interface, we actually have four different methods, which are the ones that, um, that I just mentioned. And so in the case of a request, the input is going to uh, request and response. The input and output are just like what we had before with the processor um, accessing SRAM. And in the case of um, the line request and line response, now we're using this new uh, type that we just declared, which is a line request, and then we're returning an entire line, which is 64 bytes of data. And so, um, as I mentioned, the first two methods are the processor side methods. They're the way that the processor communicates with the cache. And the other two methods are the backside methods, which is how the cache makes requests and accepts responses from main memory. Now, one thing that's uh, kind of cool is if you take a look here, the only place where we actually um, uh, specify anything about the cache size is in the, um, in the interface definition right up here. So the methods themselves don't actually know anything about the cache size. So what that means is that a user of our cache is ignorant of the size of our cache. They're basically just calling these methods, and it's only in the instantiation of our cache where we actually specify how large we wanted our cache to be. Okay, and so now our memory instantiation changes just slightly. Instead of instantiating an SRAM, what we're instantiating is this cache using the make blocking cache um, uh, method, which again is given to us. All right, so now let's dig a little deeper. So now inside of our cache, we're going to have this uh, smaller basic unit, which we call a cache array unit, OK? And so our cache array unit is going to consist of three different SRAMs. It's going to have one for the data, which is this piece over here. It's going to have one for the tag, and it's going to have one for the status, OK? And so the first thing that we're going to have to do, uh, sorry, is when we uh, actually implement this is declare those three types of, um, of SRAMs. Now, in addition to having this cache array unit, I have to have a way of communicating with both my processor and my back end. And so the way that we do that is through um, queues or FIFOs. And so specifically for my line request and my line response, I need to have a queue that allows me to, as soon as I'm ready with a request, I put it in the queue and then I'm ready to move on. Similarly, responses that come from the outside world are waiting for me there until the um, cache array unit is ready to, to deal with them. And on the processor side, we have a hit queue, which is where I'm going to put the data that's ready for the processor to, to receive. And finally, I also have two um, pieces of state that I store, which is a status of where I am in dealing with this cache request and um, a copy of the current request so that I can extract information about the address that's being requested depending on you know, which stage of my uh, dealing with this cache request I'm in. All right, so now what's the functionality of this cache array unit? So it also has a set of methods, right? So we're going to have the outside blocking cache, and inside it, it's going to have this cache array unit, which you're going to implement as part of lab six. So the things that the cache array unit can do is it's got three methods it supports. It can take a request, it can provide a response, and it also has this update method. So let's see what each one of those is. So suppose you know that I have I'm requesting something from my cache array unit, and um, you can kind of think of this cache array unit as one way of a cache. Okay, so in the case of a direct mapped cache, you would just have one of these cache array units. In the case of a two-way set associative cache, you would have two of these cache array units. Okay, but uh, at a basic level, the cache array units operate as independent things and you just potentially need to access more than one of them. So if I'm, you know, doing a load and I, you know, provide the index that I'm, um, that I'm trying to access in my cache and I look up the tag from that line and it turns out that I have a hit, then all I need to do is return um, the, the word that was requested. 
if I um, uh, did a store and I also got a hit, then in this case I don't actually need to return anything, I just update my cache array unit. Now, what about in the case of a miss? In the case of a miss, what I want to be able to do is to, um, to potentially evict a line from the cache so that I can bring the line that I'm actually trying to access into the cache. And so what we want the cache array unit to return in the case of a miss is an entire line so that if I need to, if it's dirty, I can then go and make a separate request to the uh, main memory and tell it to write that line back to main memory. Okay, so our responses from our cache array unit are either a word when I have a load hit, nothing when I have a store hit, or an entire line when I have a miss. Okay? All right. Um, so let's start taking a look at the interface of this cache array unit. So as I mentioned, we have these three methods, request, response, and update. And so let's take a look at what each of those um, is doing. So actually, before we get into that, let's talk about these particular um, data types that are being passed as part of these methods. So specifically, we introduce this new data type called uh, cache array unit uh, response and what it consists of is three things. So it's going to hold um, information about whether you got a load hit, a store hit, or a miss, which were the three cases that we just discussed, and that's what's mentioned in this um, enumeration right here. If we have a load hit, it's going to return um, the word that you're looking for in the load value parameter. And if we have a miss, it's going to return the entire line in the tagged line parameter. Okay? Um, now, if we have uh, to actually update something because we're doing a store, then we're going to call an update command. And in that case, we're going to provide the index that we're trying to access and the new line that we want to write um, to at the, in that index. Okay? So, pretty straightforward, I think. Yes? When we make a request to the CAU, how is that different from making an update request? So a request is just asking to see if it has something. An update request is telling it to change one of its lines. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah? Oh, sorry, say that again? Oh, that's just an arbitrary name. Oh, sorry, yes. This should be hit miss type. That's what you were trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. There's, uh, I've caught a number of little mistakes in these slides, but not quite all of them. All right, any other questions? Okay. So, let's now go ahead and start implementing this cache array unit. Okay, so we've got our, um, uh, the first thing that we do is we are going to call a make CAU or make a cache array unit and we have to feed it the number of bits of our index and that's what is referred to here as log n lines, right? So log n lines is basically the number of bits of index, meaning that the number of lines that I'm going to have in my cache is 2 to the log n lines. Now. Um, for the rest of this, what is going to be given to you guys is basically uh, some code, but also some pseudocode, because this is what you're actually going to be implementing in Lab 6 yourselves. So we want to give you enough information to understand how to do Lab 6, but um, obviously still make it a learning experience. So, first thing that we're going to do in our cache array unit is, as I mentioned, is we're going to instantiate three different SRAMs. We're going to have the status SRAM, the, ta the tag SRAM, and the data SRAM. In addition, we're going to have internal to the CAU some kind of status register that's going to tell us what state we're in in dealing with um, our uh, cache array unit request. And we're going to have a copy of the current request so that once again we can refer to it if we need to get um, the address uh, that was requested or, or anything like that. Alright, so what does our request look like? 
a request is going to basically initiate a request to each one of these arrays and it's going to um, take the, the current request which we call R and save it into this current request register that we have. So nothing too complicated. What about our response? Well in order to respond from the cache array unit there's a number of things that we have to do. So first we have to wait for these um, three SRAMs to give, to give us back information. So once they give me back information, I'm going to compare my tag. Um, I'm going to use, sorry, so uh, first I'm going to look at, this, at the request and that's going to tell me which index you know, am I actually looking at and what, cat, what tag am I looking for um, and what's the word offset that I need. And then I'm going to determine whether I have you know, a load hit, a store hit, or a miss based on the line that's being given back to me from this cache array unit. So in the case of a load hit, as we mentioned, we want to return the word. And so I would fetch that word um, uh, from the returned line. In the case of a store, I just update the word in the cache array unit. And in the case of a miss, I'm going to return the entire line. And then uh, here we go, sorry. Update is basically going to receive a line as input together with the index that that line should be written to and it's going to update my um, cache array unit with that line. Okay, yes? I'm, I'm a bit lost because we said that we want to use cache array units in the implementation of an SRAM, but here we're saying to in instantiate SRAMs for the components that make up the cache array unit. So don't think of uh, that we're trying, we're trying to implement a cache. Don't think of we're trying to implement S an SRAM. So uh, a cache consists of SRAM memory as its fundamental core, but so really the SRAM is a, a building block with it in order to build our cache, right? So what we're actually building is what we call this blocking cache. Within this blocking cache, we have this cache array unit. If it's a direct match cache, I have one of these cache array units. If it's a N-way set associative cache, then I would have N of these cache array units. Okay, so we're just trying to, you know, modularize it so that the implementation of each piece is as simple as possible. So I guess my question can be reduced to what's the benefit of using SRAMs for these three components of the CAU over choosing like an array implementation? Uh, the benefit is the fact that SRAMs are very fast. Okay. So that's really what we're trying to get here is we're trying to get something that's going to respond very quickly. Okay, any other questions? All right, terrific. So as I mentioned, this is what you're gonna be building in lab six. And we're gonna give you a little bit more guidance, okay? So now we're gonna take one step out, okay? And so we just talked about this cache array unit, which is a thing in this little orange box. And now we're back out to our entire uh, blocking cache, okay? So as I mentioned, because this is a direct map cache, we just have one of these cache array units in it. And the cache itself um, has these four methods which we need to implement, um, as well as you know, figure out how to deal with these queues depending on what it is that we're doing, okay? And so that's what we're gonna talk about next. So the four methods that we have are these request method, response, line request, and line response. And we're going to have to start off when we create this cache by instantiating all the different pieces of state. Okay? So what are my pieces of state in this cache? What's the first thing I need to instantiate? Yeah, I need to have a CAU. Okay? So I'm going to call make CAU to instantiate a CAU. All right, now we talked about the fact that I also have these queues, okay? So I'm going to also instantiate three FIFOs, one for each of my queues, and I'm gonna instantiate two registers, one to store the current request and one to store um, the state that I'm in, okay? Now, the FSM that, that the blocking cache is basically following is one that has the following uh, set of states. So I start off in my ready state, which means I'm ready to accept a request. Next thing I do is I go to the wait 
for cache array unit response. So I ask my cache array unit for uh, information and I'm waiting for it to respond. If it gives me returns with a hit, then I'm just going to return that data to my processor and I'm going to go back to the ready state and I'm ready to start a new request. If it has a miss, then I'm going to have to go through two additional states, which are send request and wait DRAM response. So send request is going to ask the main memory uh, for the piece of information that we're trying to fetch. Then we're going to have to wait for the main memory to respond. After it responds, we're going to update our cache and then we'll be able to go back to the ready state. Okay? And so this is um, uh, the logic that you'll have to implement. So um, first, let's start with a three with a four methods. Okay, so in order to get started, in order to get a request, it needs to be the case that we're in the state ready. Okay, so we have this um, uh, condition of checking with that we're in ready to get started, and then the method itself is relatively simple. What we're going to do is we're going to get this memory request. We're going to pass it along to the CAU. We're going to store it in this current request register, and we're going to update our state to go to our next state. Any questions about that? Good. Okay, how about a response? So the response, what it's going to do is it's just going to be looking at this queue to determine whether something has been placed into the queue or not. So when I'm trying to respond um, to my processor, I'm going to check, is there something in my hit queue? And if there is, I'm going to return that by calling hit queue.first. That basically returns the first element of your queue. And it's going to dequeue that element so that I now have room in my, um, uh, in my queue to put a new value in. Okay? And remember that these things are happening in parallel. So whether I wrote um, the, the hit DQ doesn't happen, you know, before I, uh, I return the value. I'm, I'm always reading first and then doing the DQ. Okay, so now what about on my main memory side? So on my main memory side, I have a line request, um, which is basically going to talk to the line request queue. And so once again, it's going to basically pass to the outside world that first element in that queue if one exists. And finally, the line response is going to do the reverse. It's going to get something from the main memory and put it into um, this line response uh, queue by calling the NQ method. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? Is the blocking cache, um, I guess, blocking in both directions? I say, I find the question, uh, obviously I can't do multiple requests at the same time. Can the line request happen at the same time while I'm requesting? Uh, so no, so it's completely just one request at a time. So basically imagine, you know, the processor makes a request. If I have to go to main memory, I have to go to main memory. I have to wait for main memory to respond to me. Only then am I responding to the processor. And at that point, I'll go back to the ready state and then the processor can make another request. Okay? Yes? So, I mean, is there never going to be anything, any more than like one thing to do? Yes, so in the, in, because this is a blocking cache, then there would be only one thing in the queue. But we're trying to kind of give you, you know, the general picture of how this would look so that even if you wanted to implement something more complex, that you would have the, the framework to do it. Okay? All right. So um, now let's talk about our, uh, our rules, okay? So we said that we have a bunch of rules we, are gonna, we have to implement. We're going to go through a few of those. Okay, so first is the wait for cache array unit response. So what's going to happen here? What's going to happen is uh, we first need to wait till there is a response. So this is essentially an implicit guard. In other words, this rule won't fire until the cache array unit actually has a response for us. Once it has a response, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into this variable x, and then I can look at the various pieces of that response. So remember, the first thing that is included in the response is whether I got a load hit, a store hit, or a miss. And so depending on that case, I'm going to do different things. Yeah? So first one, do you have to put parentheses for it to be like a method sort of thing? Like a rest? Here? Yeah, the rest. 
Uh, after it? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. If they're, they're, it, it's always safe to put the parentheses. It's possible that they're optional. Okay? All right, um, so what do we do on a load hit? Well, on a load hit, the cache array unit is going to return a value in the load value field. And so we're going to take that load value field, we're going to put it into some variable v, and then we're going to put that v into our hit queue so that the processor can now come and fetch that value from our hit queue. Okay? And then we're going to go back to the ready state because we had a hit and so we're ready to start all over again. In the case of a store hit, we don't have to return anything, so here all we do is just immediately go back to the ready state. Okay? The one that's more complicated, obviously, is the miss. So let's talk about what happens on a miss. So on a miss, we're going to get an entire line back from the cache array unit. So we're going to take a look at that line. And the first thing we're going to check is, is it dirty? Okay? If it's dirty, that means I need to write it back to main memory. Okay? So if it's dirty, then I'm going to initiate a line request, um, where, which is going to say store, you know, this line that I just fetched from my C, got back from my CAU, uh, sorry, this address, which I can actually determine from my original uh, request in the, um, in the register that I saved, as well as the line that was uh, returned to me. And then I'm going to go to the send request uh, state, meaning that I just sent a request to my main memory. Now, if it wasn't dirty, then I can skip the send request state and immediately go to make my request for the new piece of data that I want from my DRAM. Okay, and so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what's the address of the, the new value that I'm trying to get, and I'm going to initiate a request which says do a load of this new address and give me back that data. Okay, and now here I'm going to go, my next state is going to be my wait DRAM response state. Okay? Yes? How does send request know um, where to get the request from? How does send request? So send request is one of your states, and so, I mean, uh, Part of what you're going to be doing is implementing what the rules are for each, uh, you know, what, for each of these states, and so um, you're going to you have access to what the cache. So, so you so remember, if you're in the blocking cache, right, you have access to this current request state register. So you can always look at it in order to determine things, okay? So in fact, let me now take the opportunity to answer your question from before, which was, what's the size of the address when you make a line request? So because we're actually requesting, you know, 16 words at a time, it basically means that your address is everything from your original address minus the offset bits, okay? So when you create this line address request here, you're going to take your tag from your initial request and your index bits and concatenate them together and that will make up your line address. Make sense? Great. Okay, so... Let's see, just have a few more minutes. So we're almost there. Okay, so let's move on to the wait DRAM response state. And so what happens here is I'm going to check my queue to see if I have something available. And if I do, I get it from the queue. And then I'm going to extract information from, once again, my current request so that I know what to do with this thing that I just got back. So specifically, if my current request was a load, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out the offset bits from my initial request, and I'm going to, um, to access this long, you know, 16-word line at um, the offset that I actually want to access so that I can give back to the processor the specific word that it's requesting, okay? And so what I'm going to put into my hit 
Q is just a single word. So when I say line of W offset, I'm fetching the one word from that entire line that I actually want, okay? And so I'm giving that back to the processor. And then in addition, I'm updating my CAU with this line that was just sent to me, given to me from main memory. And so I update it with a status clean because I just brought it in from main memory. I haven't made any changes to it, so it's valid and I have not written to it, so it's clean, okay? Then if I um, detect that instead I wanted to do a store, now what I have to do is I have to take this line that I received from my main memory and I have to modify it in the location where uh, of the word that I actually want to change. So I'm going to set line of W offset to the data that I'm trying to write. And then I'm going to update my uh, CAU with this updated line and I'm going to mark the status as dirty because I actually just did a write. Okay? Any questions about that? Good. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to go back to the ready state. Okay, so... Um, I actually think, well, I'll just finish this one last slide. Then the, the last slide is just uh, talks about the details of when you implement the, uh, the two-way cache, just what are the things that you need to think about. But just a quick word on performance, and we'll stop here, which is, you know, when I compare my performance of a hit versus a miss, the hit is really very fast. It's really just dependent on the time that it takes me to access my level one cache. And assuming that I implement my hit queue design well, you can basically kind of think of it as one, you know, one clock cycle delay when I have a hit. When I have a miss, however, I have two possibilities. I either have to um, take something, uh, write something back to my main memory, or I don't, okay? So if I don't have to write something back to my main memory, meaning I didn't have anything dirty, then I'm just going to have a data RAM load latency, and I'm going to have two SRAM latencies. One was for my first check to see if it was there and to realize that it's not in the cache. Then I bring something from main memory. Once I bring it into my memory, I start get it, look for it again in the cache, and I return it. And then the last one, is if I do have something dirty. So now my latency is first I have to do a store to main memory, then I have to do a read from main memory, and I have this two SRAM uh, cost. And so just, you know, to keep in mind that um, the design decision of actually looking at the SRAM twice is kind of inconsequential in comparison to the amount of time it takes us to get to the main memory. And so uh, we don't worry about that at all. And that just simplifies the implementation. All right, everybody, thank you and have a great day.